I did a shoulder fellowship after my sports fellowship, so my, my central uh, interest is uh, shoulder. And I'm part of a group at Midwest Orthopedic Institute. Um, we started a subspecialty-based musculoskeletal clinic, so we have all subspecialties of orthopedics now. Uh, Courtney was a patient uh, years ago with us uh, when we were small, and now we've grown, and so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of different specialties to service your needs. I'm going to talk about rotator cuff uh, injuries in the corporate athlete. And as a physician and a uh, healthcare provider, as we start to think about this, we like to think about overuse, uh, overload, uh, acute injuries, and age-related changes, which we're all familiar with. And on the uh, right slide, you can see a partial thickness tear. This could be an acute injury. It could be uh, a uh, degenerative tear. Uh, we don't know. We use our history from the patient to try to uh, fill out the gaps. So we don't really diagnose exclusively, uh, especially with regard to causation by imaging study alone. On the right side, you see degenerative type changes in the rotator cuff tendinopathy. Uh, these can also be associated with trauma, however. So when we think about the shoulder and the rotator cuff specifically, uh, we think about the uh, anatomy. Um, the front view um, is the subscapularis. Uh, the top is the supraspinatus, which you probably see in reports is frequently uh, torn. Uh, the infraspinatus and teres minor are the posterior muscles, and they can also be torn in uh, rotator cuff injuries. Uh, these muscles are used to center the shoulder, so the power muscle, which is the deltoid muscle, uh, can elevate the arm. So these are the fine muscles that allow the shoulder to move smoothly. I, I tell my patients that it's like a, a, a hinge. So the deep muscles of the rotator cuff really secure the hinge, so the big muscle, which is the deltoid, can allow the shoulder to move smoothly. And when we also think about the rotator cuff, we think about extrinsic factors that can cause wear, like the bony anatomy. So you'll see reports in x-ray that say the patient has a type 1 acromion. That's a flat acromion where the outlet uh, for the supraspinatus tendon is wide open. And the most narrow outlet is the type 3 where they have a hook. And this can be acquired with spurring associated with age and wear and tear, or it can be congenital. Around the shoulder, we think about the bursitis patients, the painful shoulder. The bursa is actually a good structure. It's a, it's a padding in the shoulder that uh, is situated between the muscle and the overlying bony acromion. So it provides a cushion as we go to move our arm. But it can get inflamed and thickened, as you see over on the right slide. And um, it can be a source of pain in and of itself. So, just understanding a little bit of the anatomy of the shoulder, we think about what the causes are of shoulder pain. It can be bursitis, it can be a problem with the tendon, um, like a tendonitis or a partial tear. We can think about rotator cuff tears and the type of tears there are, acute, acute on chronic, chronic tears. And finally, the bottom is the end stage, the rotator cuff arthropathy, where there are actually fixed bony changes around the shoulder which are the end result of chronic tearing. Here are some of the bursa around the shoulder, the subacromial bursa right under that bony shelf, the subdeltoid bursa, and the subcoracoid bursa. And uh, on this side, you see the uh, MRI image of an inflamed bursa. You see a fluid signal. It can be thick. Uh, sometimes it's associated with tendon changes under it. And here's uh, a depiction of that as a schematic. So the bursa gets thickened, and then as the patient goes to elevate their arm, the bursa will get squeezed, and it can be painful and become fibrotic and scarred. The underlying uh, tendon then can start to see changes, like we see on this MRI, where there's intrinsic changes within the tendon. The spectrum goes on to uh, partial thickness tears. Um, on the left side is a bursal-sided tear associated with a bursitis. And on the right side, on, on your right, is a, uh, is a partial thickness articular tear, which is most commonly associated with overload. Now, 
Now, we transition then from the partial tears to the full tears, the schematic um, on your left, and the depiction with an MRI. You can see where the tendon is supposed to attach on the greater tuberosity, and here's the rolled edge of the tendon. And there's fluid between the two, so the muscle pulls the tendon uh, from its attachment, and that gap won't fill in unless it's surgically repaired. As we continue on, the conti on this um, continuum of disease, we look frequently at the patient. Do they have atrophy? What's the history? How chronic is the disability? And that helps us establish what kind of tear it is. But the medial sagittal imaging on the MRI is also very helpful. So if we look at this MRI, we see a very um, substantial supraspinatus muscle here. Uh, this is a very medial sagittal cut on the MRI. And if you look at the one on your right, you'll see that this MRI uh, image shows a very small supraspinatus with a lot of fat and a fibrosis surrounding it. So that muscle is very, uh, very small. And that indicates more of a chronic circumstance. And the treatment may be different for these patients. So if we see uh, tears, we see the acute one with the good muscle, then we can see chronic changes, and finally, there are those very difficult patients who have chronic changes superimposed on an acute injury, perhaps from lifting something heavy or from a fall while at work, and they're acute on chronic. So they may have an acute tear superimposed on an older injury. And sometimes the older injuries are not repairable, and the acute injury needs to be addressed, but these are very complex patients. So here's a patient who has a tear, we see it here. Here's where it should be attaching, and there's fluid and inflammatory response. And over here on the right, we see the medial sagittal imaging showing that the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus are chronic injuries, but if this patient has subscapularis weakness, this would be an acute subscapularis tear. So it's an acute on chronic circumstance, very difficult to uh, treat at times. Finally, the end of the spectrum are the chronic tears and the rotator cuff arthropathy. So here we see fixed bony changes in the shoulder. Um, the rotator cuff is gone, the deltoids pulled up the humeral head, and it's formed basically a new socket, so there's bony remodeling. And here's an example of what that would look like. There's bony remodeling on the acromion, on the MRI, and the tendon is way retracted and atrophic. And this is really a different entity from a regular rotator cuff tear. So this requires a whole different algorithm for treatment. So just understanding a little bit about the spectrum of things that you're going to see and deal with amongst your patients, uh, let's talk about how we, as uh, surgeons, look at patients when they first come in. So we first do a history, and then we do a clinical exam, which involves all of the components that you're very, very familiar with, inspection, palpation, range of motion, strength testing, special testing, never forget the neck. The neck is always lurking there, and when you get into patients who are in their 50s, 60s, and even their 70s, they'll have concurrent neck disease. So you need, really need to look at that as a possible cause of of their problems. So the first thing I do is I have the patients disrobe and get a look at their thorax. Um, this patient on um, your left, if you look at him, he has a drooped shoulder. So what's the cause of that? If he's having shoulder pain on that side, that may be a trapezial palsy. So you won't know that unless you get behind the patient and actually physically look at them. So there are lots of things that masquerade as primary shoulder pain, which are actually coming from some other source. And on this side, um, you'll see this infraspinatus atrophy and uh, some component of supraspinatus atrophy. That patient may have a chronic rotator cuff tear or they may have a neurologic problem, like a suprascapular nerve entrapment. So yeah, isn't this a cool slide? So you want to not only look at people, you want, not only want to look at them statically, but you want to look at them dynamically. So here you have a patient. I mean, it doesn't look too bad. Um, there may be something going on in that scapula, or they may not be. But look at the patient on your right, and as soon as you have them dynamically use their shoulder, you see a serratus palsy, long thoracic nerve palsy. 
Palpation is important, so outlining some of the things that you guys are going to be seeing in your reports. You know, the sternoclavicular joint here, AC joint, the coracochromial ligament, the chromium, rotator cuffs under here. Palpating the rotator cuff, all of these are very fundamental, and I know you see these reports every day. So then we do uh, strength and motion testing. This is uh, the cardinal planes of motion, elevation, external rotation, internal rotation. This is what they look like. Uh, I also do abduction because that's a functional range as well. And then strength testing, the supraspinatus stress test, external rotation testing, the belly press, lift off tests, all very fundamental. We do some special tests, the Speeds and O'Brien's test, which are, are good tests but not perfect for biceps pathology. All these things get rolled into the reports that you see. And then finally, we do the other stuff, which is equally important. You know, the neurovascular evaluation, the distal motor exam. Um, you know, once in a while, I'll have patients come back from shoulder injuries, and I'll have operate on them, and they develop a carpal tunnel. Well, was that because they were swollen in surgery? You know, they had post-surgical immobilization. Uh, you know, they want to say, well, you know, I never had this before. It's very helpful to recognize that they had it in the preoperative evaluation so that you can let them know, we, we discussed this, we knew about this, this is something that you had pre-existing. So you got to look for it if you're going to find it. And, you gotta, and when you find it, you got to document it. Let's see if I can. Um, so then once we're done with the physical exam, we start looking at the other sources of information, the radiography, the advanced imaging. And so we start looking at um, different x-ray views. And probably in most clinical practices, the x-ray views are the most challenging to get consistency on because there's a lot of variability in how techs shoot their films. So uh, we really try to be uh, very rigid about the quality with regard to this imaging. So here's a patient on your left, comes in with shoulder pain, and um, looks, could be a rotator cuff tear, could be a severe tendonitis, but lo and behold on their x-ray they got calcific disease. So the, the feeling that we have when we examine this patient who has rotator cuff weakness is probably this is an exacerbated calcific tendonitis. So this pre-existed an injury, but now it's been exacerbated and it's now an active problem and cause of their disability. This is uh, an outlet view and it shows one of those morphologies I was talking about where the acromion sort of curves down, the muscle tendon comes through this little space here, the supraspinatus, and that space is narrowed by that patient's intrinsic anatomy. So that might be a source of abrasion and predisposition to rotator cuff disease. Other things which I'm so sure you're starting to see are ultrasound in the office. So here's a normal ultrasound. We have uh, three units in our office and we do this frequently. Uh, this is a normal tendon. Here's a hypoechoic area in the supraspinatus indicating a partial tear. So you can make some diagnoses based on this. Other imaging, CT arthrogram. This is what that CT arthrogram will look like when you read the report that says the patient has a rotator cuff tear. So what they had done was an injection of iodine so type solution and then the iodine has leaked out so they, because they don't have containment in the joint because of the tear and you can see the edge of the tear here and it's supposed to be over here so that would be a, the diagnosis of rotator cuff tear. But MRI is my preferred advanced imaging because it gives you a lot more information I think about the soft tissue than the CAT scan does uh, and you don't need to use all the time uh, advanced uh, injection techniques. So here's a plain MRI. You can see the edge of the tendon. You can see some remaining tendon on the tuberosity and a space between the two. Now sometimes we'll use injection gadolinium MRIs or MR arthrograms and the reasons I use that in my practice, I don't use it very frequently but in patients who are post-op who continue to have pain, they can be very helpful because the imaging post-op in MRIs can be very difficult to interpret. You don't know whether 
it's just tendinopathy from the surgery or whether they may have some re-tearing. So the dye actually will help you and it'll track into the tear and you can see dye extravasating out. So you know that there's a connection between the inside and the outside which can signify a full thickness component. Here's a slap tear. This is a superior labrum and the dye is tracking, tracking under that. Is this helpful to see all these things? Yes. Great, okay. You, you just tell me, you let me know. Riveting. <laughs> is it riveting? There you go. <laughs> all right. Oh, with that, I'm all jazzed up here. So, okay, so, so we're going to talk about the management now. We're going to sort of summate this. We're going to go in little modules here. So. Um, so we're talking about the management again of the rotator cuff. So we're going to define the symptoms the patient walks in the door, understand what their disability, what their pain is, what the timing on this is. We want to establish etiology, which is very important for all of us. I mean, was this a work-related injury, a non-work-related injury, chronic, acute? We want to determine the diagnosis, and now we want to outline treatment. So this is some, this kind of a slide or this kind of information comes up all the time. What's injury related? What's there just because we're active individuals? So, so we have um, a paper from 1999, an ultrasound study on 411 asymptomatic volunteers. So I'm in my 50s, sorry to say, but I'm in my 50s and I have uh, a 13% chance of having a rotator cuff tear. So one in eight people who are in their 50s are going to have some rotator cuff disease. When I get up into my 80s, it's a 50-50 chance. So we know as we get older, there are intrinsic changes in our rotator cuff which, cause, which go on and can cause tearing, regardless of trauma. And these are asymptomatic individuals. So how do we manage rotator cuff disease? When somebody comes in with a painful shoulder to our office, and maybe they it just came on gradually, um, and they don't have a lot of weakness. Uh, we might try non-surgical options like rest, NSAIDs, physical therapy, injections, and for those scapular um, balance issues, we might do taping or bracing. So uh, if somebody has a full thickness rotator cuff tear, what's the chance that therapy alone will help them? Because therapy does have a positive effect. Um, we see that in this study, which was just uh, published, in a prospective co cohort, this was atraumatic rotator cuff tears. Limited application here, but this was the best article I could find. Um, there were only 50, about 50% 50 employed in this population, so this was a more sedentary group. So if you just did rehab on this group, only 25% of people wanted surgery. So just physical therapy alone is helpful. So with that in mind, as we see patients with rotator cuff tears, we've examined them, we understand their disability and their circumstances, and we've diagnosed them on imaging studies, when do we go to the next step to recommend surgical management? Um, so I generally will say after three months of good conservative care, if they don't really have a significant rotator cuff tear, not a high grade partial or full, I will wait the three months and see how they do with conservative management, because a lot of them will get better. But if they're not better in three or four months, then usually the, they're frustrated and they're ready to move on. Maybe they just need a bursectomy, maybe they need some excision of, of some um, impinging spurs. Um, but that's when the dialogue of surgical management for me begins. But if somebody comes in and they're an acute tear in a laborer or somebody who needs to really use their arms, and they're disabled, they're active, they're having pain, then I go down a surgical management. So an acute tear in somebody who really needs to be active um, is, uh, is better probably managed with surgical treatment. And when we have the dialogue with the patient, sometimes these patients come in and they have chronic tears and then they fall in and now they have an acute tear. That tear is going to behave differently than someone who has good muscle, good tendon, and they've had normal, a normal shoulder. And some people don't always realize that, gee, that ache that I've had for 10 years, that was actually something significant, but they've sort of powered through it, and now they can't do it anymore. Now, 
important to understand is that I just had a guy in my office earlier today, he's 80. So he's driving a forklift um, <laughs> at his daughter's <laughs> welding company. And he steps off the forklift and he sprains his ankle. And he comes in, he's got a cuboid fracture. So, I, you know, this was actually why I was a little bit late. So, so, um, so I go in to see him because he gets triage from another doctor who sees him, and, um, who's not an orthopedic surgeon and says, you know, you got to see this guy. So I walk in, I say, you know what, I think we need to put you in a boot. And he goes, you can't put me in a boot. And I said, why? He said, my daughter will kill me, and she'll never let me drive the forklift again. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, just because people are older doesn't mean, chronologically, doesn't mean they're physiologically old. So, you know, this has to be a dialogue and an understanding of the patient's biology as best we can, we can do that. And again, the management surgically, we want to look at um, the static anatomy of the shoulder. So if this shoulder is proximally migrated and there's bony changes around the shoulder, then this is a different entity. This is a different treatment algorithm. This is that rotator cuff arthropathy that has a whole different decision tree. So the rationale for surgery in these patients is to maximize healing. We know that intact um, repairs have better outcomes. And there is some time issues with regard to this because the tears do tend to enlarge, especially if the patients are active. Um, so non-surgical management for full thickness tears, even though I just presented the fact that if you rehab them, they'll probably do okay in the lower demand individuals. I always have a very informed dialogue with my patients about the fact that, yeah, you don't hurt right now, but your, your activity expectations are high. And if you let this go for six to 12 months, by the time you come back and you're miserable, this may not be fixable. So there's really a lot of parlay that goes on between the patient and the doctor in these injuries. These are not clear cut. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. It really has to be a contract between the doctor and the patient. So let's talk about size. We know that small tears get bigger with time. So what's the benefit? What, what do the studies show about how uh, smaller tears behave relative to larger tears? Here's a study by Cole from 2007, 138 patients. They did MRI at a minimum of two years after they did a repair, and they found that um, their smaller tears only had a recurrence rate of 16%, whereas their larger massive tears, almost half of them retore. So it's a big difference. And also that age thing crops up because the intact repairs were generally present in younger people. So with that in mind, what are the contraindications that I use relative to rotator cuff repairs? Well, chronic um, situations where there's no muscle left. You know, you look at that MRI and you say, you know what, I really, really, with my heart, want to help you, but a rotator cuff repair is not going to be a good option for you because I'm going to put you through months of, the, first of all, the risk of surgery, months of rehab, and your outcome, you know, I can't guarantee. <coughs> So if there's severe retraction, that's another relative contraindication. But I'm not scared about retraction if the muscle's good. I mean, I'll go in there and I'll do extensive releases, and most of the time you can get that muscle and tendon back to where it needs to be. It's the atrophy that so profoundly affects the outcome in my hands anyway. Again, the fixed proximal migration, and once again, this is just a different entity than just a rotator cuff repair. When we go in, we try to do everything. I tell patients, listen, you know, if I go in there and I see something else that I have an aha moment, have you guys ever had an aha moment where you go in and you're like, oh, that really makes sense. We were just talking about that. You know, you think you know everything, but you really don't. So you're in there and you say, oh my gosh, now I understand why that patient had that problem. It's not only this rotator cuff tear, but there's also something else going on. We get all of that done at once. Oops, I skipped a slide, let me go back. So we repair the tendon, we try to get it anatomically reduced, 
And we do all this other, other stuff. You get the little red dot here. All the other stuff that may need to be done to optimize the outcome. So the options that you'll see in the records that you review and you see and the patients that you handle, you'll see a variety of different types of repairs. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that to sort of fill you in on the details. But um, you'll see anatomic repairs where the operative reports will say, and the tendon was brought back to the footprint or, you know, it was reduced to the greater tuberosity. That's what everybody loves because those are the best types of repairs to have. But sometimes in these patients, despite the best preoperative evaluations, you can't get it there. So you're dealing with a circumstance called margin convergence where you're sort of pulling things over. I tell patients, you know, I work so hard on your rotator cuff repair, it was like pulling my underwear over my head without <laughs> removing it. So, you know, I try to give them analogies that, like, they're going, oh my God, you know. So, and then finally, there's partial rotator cuff repairs, which sometimes you get in and you can't even get your underwear over your head, you know. It's just, it's just not going to move. So you do partial repairs. So here's an anatomic repair. This is an example of a surgical picture and then the schematic on your right where it's a double row construct where this is repaired right down to where it came from. And you know, if the patient has a correct biology, this should do well because it's a small, maybe a medium-sized tear in this circumstance. This is a margin convergence. It's a tear where you're pulling stuff together and trying to just get things to where they're close to the greater tuberosity and then putting them down. So it's not an anatomic repair. And finally, this is a schematic from actually that was drawn during my fellowship. It's the suspension bridge technique of doing partial rotator cuff repairs where you pull from the front and pull from the back and try to balance the function of what rotator cuff remains. And that will hopefully help them elevate their arm. So again, things you'll see in your operative reports and your patient management, different devices, different techniques. You'll hear allusions to biology. I mean, that's really what this is all about, is what is the biology of the patients? Another thing I always say to my patients is, just because you're good looking doesn't mean you're going to heal faster. <laughs> because people have magical thinking. They believe that if you go in there and they come out, you could draw little red lines on them in marker. And if they came out with those little red lines, they would think that, you know, somehow the, you know, Jesus light came down and now they're fine and they can do whatever they want. But it's not true. So it really requires a lot of reinforcement to have people understand the biology of the process that goes on in rotator cuff healing. So let's talk a little bit about that. So we have all these different devices that you'll hear of, peak anchors, metal anchors, absorbable anchors, new biocomposite anchors, open, arthroscopic, double row, single row. Do you, all of you guys see this routinely in the records and the patients that you're taking care of? Well, let's critically evaluate what all this means, because I think it's very confusing. One of the things that we know as surgeons is that Fixing the rotator cuff is a reparative process. So by putting it back, we're actually creating an environment where the rotator cuff can scar down. It's not going to reconstitute normal tendon. So it's going to heal with scar like all other healing around our body. We know that age is a negative prognosticator, so we advise our patients relative to that biology. And age 65 seems to be a watershed. So how do we try to modify biology as surgeons? We try patches. So uh, you'll see patches probably occasionally in your patients. What kind of patches are there? They run the gamut. Synthetic, allograft, which means it comes from a human. Those are typically dermal patches. Then there are xenografts from porcine's pig. Uh, oh, man, I keep doing that. Sorry. Uh, cow, horses. There's dermis, there's subintestinal tissue, there's pericardium, there's cross-linked, non-cross-linked. It's a smorgasbord. But uh, if we look at this, basically, if you skip down to the bottom line, there's no clear evidence for the use of patches in routine use around the shoulder. 
so this is a surgical decision that a, that a surgeon makes at the time of surgery, frequently, whether he, can get the, he or she can get the, the rotator cuff back and whether reinforcement would be of benefit to the patient. So it's sort of a boutique uh, kind of uh, decision-making tree that we go through at the time of surgery, typically. What we, what we do know is that, the, that we want the grafts, these extracellular matrix or patches to be load sharing. So we want to get the tendon back as best we can and then put the patch over the top so it can share and reinforce the repair. We know that this is going to be an area that's probably going to explode in the next decade because these are vehicles for great things to happen in the shoulder. We can put mesenchymal stem cells in there. We can put growth factors in there. This is all going to start to develop as we go forward. But we're not there yet, so we don't have clear indications for the use of patches in the shoulder. And in fact, I'm sorry I keep flipping around, but there are only two randomized clinical trials in the literature with regard to the use of patches. There's Barber's study in 2011 where he used dermal grafts, had a positive effect. And then there's Joe Iannotti's study in 2006 where he used porcine grafts, and he had a bad effect. So there's just not a lot of data out there. What about PRP? That has been like a comet, right? It came out of, I don't know where it came out of, but about two or three years ago, we started hearing about PRP. All the professional athletes were getting it. It was shifting, you know, it was like vetted by Sports Illustrated, right? Because <laughs> people were coming in and going, you know, Derek Jeter got this, I want this too, you know? So, um, so it, it really didn't have a lot of critical evaluation, and, but it, it really had an ascendancy to prominence in the commercial marketplace. So we're trying to figure, I keep doing that, darn it. So anyway, what is PRP? It's the patient's own blood, it gets spun down, and it concentrates the platelets. So you're putting very concentrated platelets in, in the uh, shoulder, for instance, and platelets themselves are non-nucleated particles in the blood, and they are helpful in clotting. So when you think, if you cut your skin, what's the first thing? You bleed, you clot, you form a scab. But joints can't form scabs because they have prote proteins in the joints that break down scar. So they don't form clot or scabs like we do on our skin. But what the platelets do in the healing process is they have growth factors and cytokines and all these good chemicals that get released. So the thought was that they would stimulate a lot of healing. Now, one of the dilemmas is that there are so many different types of PRP because it hit the market and everybody wants to make themselves different. So it's very difficult to evaluate. So here we have the activated PRP. So um, that's a particular type of preparation. When you introduce that into the, into the area you want uh, to put your PRP, the alpha granules release 70% of all their stored factors within 10 minutes, and by an hour, everything's gone. If you do non-activated PRP, when it gets exposed to collagen, it slowly releases its factors, which we think intuitively may be better. And then finally, when you add calcium chloride, it forms like a gel, a gooey gel, like uh, the stuff that kids play with, you know? And that slowly releases factors. So that may be the preferred type of PRP to put in. It's called a uh, uh, platelet-rich fibrin matrix. Now, the problem is that if you look at all the studies down here, there's no clear benefit. You know, it's very difficult to prove because the studies are not randomized, and there's not a lot of patients frequently, and the products are very different. We talk a little bit about the biology and advising our patients about delayed repairs. Again, it can have a negative effect. The tissue can get more scarred and contracted. And um, I just uh, attended and helped to uh, instruct at a, at a course for the AOS, and uh, Lisa Gallitz is a really great thinker. She's from Washington University. She has studied a lot of the biology of healing of rotator cuffs. And uh, she uh, presented some of this data, also discussing that when the rotator cuff tears, 
that there's bone loss. There's actual bone loss in the humeral head. And some of the uh, healing process may actually be within the bone. What about uh, smoking? How many times do we talk to our patients and say, you know what, we're going to do this repair. Can you please stop smoking? How many people actually stop? I would say in my practice, standing on my head, uh, probably 15%. Um, so we know that from Lisa's uh, rat studies where she gave the rats nicotine, it, she actually cut their rotator cuff and did repairs and she found that in the rats receiving nicotine there was delayed healing. It decreased on a, on a basic biology level the metabolism and the synthetic activity within the tendon which is what is used to measure the type of healing. We know that there's association between smoking and rotator cuff disease. And the conclusion overall is that smoking is a risk and probably dose specific. So if you, if you get the rats to smoke two packs a day, they don't heal as well as the rats that are smoking one pack a day. <laughs> and other associations, ANSAIDs, cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, one thing that was really interesting in a study that, um, again, Gallitz did was she did uh, Botox. She repaired the rotator cuff and then she Botoxed the muscles. And she found that when she removed all the load from the tendons, that they actually healed worse. So some sort of controlled stress to the repair is very helpful. We don't really know what that is, but we have some basic science anyway to show that putting the shoulder theoretically completely at rest, I mean, it's a long distance from a rat to a human, but I mean, at least we get a sense of the biology that maybe we want to do some controlled stress in order to stimulate healing. So, um, so we know a little bit about the biology. Now let's talk about techniques and size. And let's start comparing open, arthroscopic, what does it mean? Um, because you'll probably see a full spectrum of different surgical procedures across all the surgeons that you guys um, visit with and handle. So uh, open rotator cuff repairs, assessed by Millet, um, 2009. What he did was he took these patients and he, and he said, well, we're going to follow them for 10 years and we're going to find out how many patients get additional surgery. So it, unfortunately, a lot of these studies are sort of mixed bags, but some of the patients came back, they had joint replacements, you know, so we don't know how many actually failed uh, their rotator cuff repairs, but we do know that they came back and they had additional surgery, but nonetheless, he had a 94% survivorship at five years. That means that only 6% at five years after his open repair needed any additional surgery, regardless of the cause. And by 10 years, it was 88, down to 83%. So 17% came back for additional surgery. Here's a study by uh, Julie Bishop. Um, and this is arthroscopic versus open. So they did a head-to-head -head comparison. The problem is that, they're, um, that the populations are small. What they found was they had only 40 arthroscopic and 33 open for comparison. They found that regardless of the technique, all patients improved in clinical outcomes. But the open repair edged out the arthroscopic repair when they did MRIs. So there was a 31% re retear rate in the open. 47 in the retear. You know, this pu was published in 2006. By the time this got published, they changed their technique. So this was not a double row repair, so they went on and they changed their technique. So it's, it's difficult. It's like a moving target. Um, one thing that they, well, several things they concluded was there was really no significant difference in outcome statistically, but the groups were small. Um, in the scope group, cuff integrity predicted better strength. In the open group, intact cuffs did statistically better. I'm sorry, in both groups, intact cuffs did statistically better. And smaller tears had better outcomes. And so finally, there, this was a very big review, um, very well thought out. Uh, rotator cuff integrity was better in smaller tears. And um, the open repairs, appeared to handle the larger tears better. They had better outcome. But again, the studies were small. So the, 
the upshot of this is that it probably doesn't matter, you know, I mean, a lot of people want to have the arthroscopic repairs, but you know what? I trained in open and I then developed an arthroscopic practice and my open repairs, when I trained, um, the patients did great. So I don't think we can judge necessarily um, outcome based on technique alone. There are lots of factors that go into this. So arthroscopic repairs, uh, this is a study by No. Um, and these are some of the things we've already talked about. The results of arthroscopic repairs measured on ultrasound. And one thing that he found was that row configuration, double, single row, didn't really make a difference in his uh, study. He did find, interestingly in here, that um, number one, all patients improved or generally improved in their functional outcome based on studies. ASCS is, a, is an outcome measure. Um, one thing that I found really interesting, and I read this article about five times to make sure it was correct, he ultrasounded patients at three months, one year, two years, and what he found was that the healing on ultrasound at three months was 64%, 64% at one year, and increased at two years. So I think that maybe what we're finding, and I'm going to show you some other stuff for thought just to think about, is that rotator cuffs really heal over a lengthy period of time, that they're really remodeling a lot over time. And with that, I want to just talk a little bit about rehab, because rehab is really important, right? And this is really a lot of what you guys get involved in, I think, is, you know, the surgeon's done the repair, and now the patient's recovering. So how fast should that patient recover or how slowly? And I, I've talked with quite a few of you guys today and really, the thing that really makes me feel so good is that um, everything that I hear is, you know, I want all of the patients that I handle and I take care of to get back to work safely and stay at work. So how do we make that judgment? It is so difficult because the biology of healing of these tendons is so difficult. But let's just for a minute look at several very different paradigms about how people propose to handle post-operative rehab. So we have some options. We have accelerated rehab with limited formal therapy. We have the ODG guidelines, which basically give us this kind of a recommendation, 14 visits over eight weeks for a scope, 20 visits over 10 weeks for an open. And then we have some other data in the literature that suggests, well, hold the, hold the train, let's not do any therapy for six weeks and, and, and then start therapy and see how people wind up. So we got one end of the spectrum to the other end. So where, where are we at? What are we going to do? So let's look at the studies. So uh, this is an interesting study from just uh, this year. This is a mini open repair, in a, so an, basically an open repair in a work comp population. The author took a group A, they did formal clinic-based PT with you know, limited home exercises, and then they had a different group where they handed them a pamphlet and information and said, this is your home exercise program. It's going to be structured and you're going to come back for a little bit of instruction with a therapist, but basically you're going to go do this on your own. And then they took the two groups and they tried to figure out where they were at. So, um, so the, the time period on this is, uh, is four weeks in a sling for group A and basically four weeks in a sling for group B. They did passive motion through week eight uh, for the group A and uh, active assisted range of motion in week four for group B. And by the time they get to group to week eight, they were already doing resistance exercises. So very different protocol. I'm trying. There we go. So these are the outcomes. So group A is, is on your left, group B is on your right. Uh, number of PT visits, 25, 19 in the, in the group B. Tear size was roughly equivalent. Uh, week to full duty was roughly equivalent. DOL classification, not at all equivalent. Uh, very biased to, the, uh, to group A. Measurable impairment, 
roughly comparable. These numbers are so small, I don't know that you can really make a statistical. You can just look at trends. Um, permanent partial disability, much higher. Maybe reflective of the DOL classification, I don't know. But very different, you know, some data suggesting maybe you can get away with very accelerated rehab, but very small numbers. And this is typically what you see. So we're making decisions sometimes based on, on small data sets. So uh, let's just look at the opposite end of the spectrum for a minute. This is a, an article talking about rehab following repair with limited early motion. And I just went to this meeting, uh, AOS, American Shoulder and Elbow Society meeting, where a lot of the, um, you know, the salient thinkers in the field are saying, you know, let's slow up the rehab. And, and it's based on some of this literature. Um, so here's a group, 68 patients had arthroscopic suture bridge of supraspinatus tendon repairs, 33 patients in the early passive elevation and rotation group, and group two started motion, except for pendulums at home and a little bit of this. They started passive motion at six weeks, so they were pretty shut down in terms of rehab. At one year, guess what? They were no different. Uh, there was a trend to higher rotator cuff healing in the delayed group. So let's look at that. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was uh, early motion group 85% healed, delayed group 91% healed. Interesting, right? A different way of thinking about things. Why is that? I don't know. But, you know, th people heal differently. Things are, you know, the biological environment is different in patients. So, you know, maybe this is a way of saying, listen, you know, it just takes time for biology to work in our bodies. So, but let's look at some of the animal studies. Uh, there's one that I cite here, Sonnabend, from uh, Journal of Bone and Joint, 2010. He did a primate study. He showed at four weeks that the rotator cuff is just starting to heal in their primates. So, you know, maybe that's not the time that we want to start them on active assisted, you know, more aggressive program. Let's look at this study. This is my, by far my favorite study in all of the literature that I reviewed to give this talk tonight because I can't imagine any patient in my practice allowing this to occur. So here's a guy, <laughs> here's a guy, um, he, Baring et al., a group of guys and, and uh, surgeons who um, published an article in 2011. They took 10 patients and they put in vivo, meaning they in, put markers, metal markers, in their shoulders when they did their rotator cuff repairs. So what they did was they marked the tendon edge and they followed them with x-ray. So um, let me just read the slide here. Metal markers placed in vivo in 10 patients with rotator cuff tears. So they repaired the rotator cuffs. Markers moved in all patients, all patients, suggesting a gap. So the rotator cuff over the course of their rehab was starting to fail. It was either re-tearing or it was moving and it was filling in with scar. You know, so, but there was gap formation as these patients were going through rehab. When were they most vulnerable? Well, right from the get-go, two weeks, up to 10 weeks, or three months, rather. And then when did they find the largest gaps occurring in this population? Was at 10 weeks when they started doing active flexion and abduction. And the hypothesis was, you know what, at 10 weeks, these tears may not be mature enough to handle stresses. So, you know, I mean, it's very difficult. But I thought this was a very intriguing article because, number one, anybody you know want to have metal markers put in their shoulder? Number two, doesn't it really give you a sense of what patient biologic healing is doing? It's fascinating. I mean, these markers are moving because that repair ain't holding. And what does that mean? So we know that as we get aggressive with rehab and we go into that phase at 10 weeks, which everybody thinks is safe, this tendon is starting to, starting to split apart. Is it biologically ready for that? I don't know. You know, is that patient whose marker spread gonna have a cuff defect? Or are they biologically primed to heal that space with scar? I don't know. Nobody knows, right? 
So it's, it's a very difficult area. But certainly, this data argues to, to, to delay the rehab process. Now we get to ODG guidelines, which you know, we all are aware of, right? So, so we have a formula that's been developed for how we treat patients, which is programmed. But nothing with regard to these injuries and these repairs are programmed. Everybody's different. So, you know, we have an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, manual work, dominant arm, return at three months. Seven, 70, I'm sorry, 70 to 90 days. That's like at the 10 week mark, right? 90 days is three months, 12 weeks, right? What does that mean? Open rotator cuff acromioplasty, manual work, dominant arm, three months. So, so these guidelines are difficult to work with for me. But I think we all have to understand that. As so many of you here said to me tonight, we are advocates for our patients, right? I mean, there are guidelines that we all have to look at and we have to consider them, but at the end of the day when we go home, we're advocates for the patients we serve. Now what happens if we make a wrong judgment, and I believe me, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I make a wrong judgment about my patient and they re-tear. And some of it I don't control. Again, we talked about biology. Some people are just not going to heal. But what are the reasons for failure and what are the consequences of that? Oh, brother, darn thing. Um, well, there are complications that can cause failure, deltoid, disruption, infection, foreign body, diagnostic errors, you know, hidden lesions, subscap lesions that you don't appreciate that cause disability later on, um, misdiagnosis, cervical radiculopathy, uh, pinched nerve, suprascapular neuropathy, technical errors that we have at the time of surgery. I mean, we really truly are not perfect individuals. Um, you know, we do our best, but you know, stuff happens. Um, failure to heal, that biology, which is all over the map, you know, in any study, you can pick any study, they're going to be all over the map. And of course, traumatic failures, you know, the just because you're good looking doesn't mean you're going to heal faster, patient compliance issues, accidents. What are the results? Let's look at that. So if I have a rotator cuff re-tear and I do an open repair, look at this data. Oh, it's really bad. Um, so, uh, you know, 50-50. You've gone from a circumstance, I tell my patients, listen, you got a small rotator cuff repair, uh, small medium tear, you know, probably 85. I, I think, you know, I can, I can give you probably an 85% good to excellent outcome. But if I have to re-repair that, it's 50-50, you know. So make it good the first time, because that's what this data says. Do it right the first time. Whether you're doing it arthroscopically, the revision, or the open repair is done as a revision procedure, there's a much higher failure rate probably in this population the second go around. Does work comp affect outcome? You guys have just been waiting for this slide all evening. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so um, Iannotti, a very good friend of mine, very smart guy, uh, publishes in 1996 in his article, Work Comp Doesn't Affect Outcome. And there are some articles that say that in the literature. And then there's um, this article by Cole, uh, and he saw no difference in patient satisfaction assessment functional outcome, retear or retear size. So, I mean, there are some articles out there that say, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but it's probably balanced by the huge amount of, of uh, literature saying that work comp does adversely affect outcome. So um, poor, poor outcomes in work comp, uh, Cuff and Pupello, Holby and I can't pronounce that name, Rasmjum, um, Hen, you know, all worse outcomes. A lot of them subjective, like how did they do on the dash, how did they do on their functional outcomes, um, so a lot of these are um, poor outcomes are based on patient subjective questionnaires and functional assessments. 
Uh, let's see, a Watson and Sonnabend, worse outcome, uh, work comp revision surgery in uh, younger ages. I don't know why, maybe because they were a little bit less compliant. Smith, uh, work comp, McKee and U, work comp, uh, lower SF36, both pre and post op, by the way. Missamore, 42% uh, of work comp <laughs> with the same surgeon, 42 of work comp returned to full activity versus 94% of work, wow. of non work comp. Yeah. So you guys deal with a totally loaded deck, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. So um, let's talk about the things that guide the surgeon. Well, you know, the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons put together some guidelines to try to help us, you know, struggling orthopedists to try to deal with some of these uh, controversial issues. So they came out with some guidelines about optimizing rotator cuff management. And I, and I just want you to take a look at this because it's really indicative of how controversial and difficult the literature is to evaluate. So um, they developed a panel of very, very smart doctors who did a systematic evidence-based review, and they picked great articles to try to make decisions. And what they came upon was, um, is this a consensus approval? Meaning, does everybody sort of agree that this is what should happen? There's a moderate strength recommendation, which means that the literature really sort of supports this, and then there are weak recommendations, and then they say, well, you know what, everything's so conflicted, we really can't make a decision about which is better. And let's look at what the Academy says, because this is really fascinating. So their consensus and moderate strength recommendations, their most positive recommendations are, don't operate on people who have asymptomatic full thickness rotator cuff tears. That, that I can agree with. Rotator cuff symptoms without full thickness rotator cuff tears do exercise and ANSAIDs. Try the conservative management if they don't have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Work comp correlates with less favorable outcomes, so even they, in their literature review, find that pattern. And we just looked at some of the literature that they reviewed for that statement. Routine acromioplasty is not required. And so you'll see frequently acromioplasty on your operative report. That's a surgical decision at the time of surgery frequently because you'll see that spur. It doesn't look big on the x-ray or the MRI, but you see that rotator cuff tear right under that spur. You gotta get rid of that darn spur. So, but you don't need to do it, you know, you don't need to do it routinely. It's, it's a decision that the surgeon makes at that time. Uh, avoid the grafts that are non-cross-linked, those uh, uh, submucosal grafts. And they also said that they felt as a consensus agreement that cold therapy was beneficial after repair. So with that in mind and those few recommendations, let's see what they found was inconclusive. Uh, so this is strength of recommendation inconclusive. Does rota are rotator cuff tears helped by exercise? We don't know. Are they helped by cortisone injections? We don't know. Are they helped by ANSAIDs, activity modification, ICEAT, iontophonophoresis, massage, TENS? We don't know. Are there confounding factors, diabetes, comorbidity, smoking infection, cervical disease? We don't know. Uh, surgical technique, does it make a difference? Uh, suture anchors versus bone tunnels probably doesn't make a difference. Allografts don't make a difference, types of slings. The timing of exercise, home exercise versus facility-based, there's just not enough good literature to make definitive statements about this. So we all struggle with these patients, right? And infusion catheters was the last one. They weren't, just weren't certain. So boy, every time I, I think about this, I get a headache. And I deal with this every day, so I'm taking a lot of Tylenol and ibuprofen. So, so we got dilemmas. We all got dilemmas, right? So who's going to do better? Well, you know, I've presented like a whole slew of information tonight. So what are we going to take away if we only have a couple slides to work with at the end of the day because we all got to go home and we got husbands and wives and we got kids and grandkids you know, laundry. Um, so um, who's going to do well? Uh, younger patients, smaller tears. A centered head, we don't want to deal with that head that's up against the acromion. 
We don't want to deal with very arthritic patients. That's going to be a confounding factor because that's getting into an area where it's a different entity. Minimal muscle degeneration, so we don't want a lot of atrophy, and we want good biology. I don't know. How do you determine good biology? It's tough. Who's going to do poorly? Larger tears, muscle atrophy, increasing age, patient habits and compliance. We want to optimize outcomes by trying to get those patients, because we know in our heart that smoking is really bad. Uh, we want to get them to follow direction. We want to try to pick the patients who are going to benefit from early repairs and give them early repairs. We want to understand the biology and the limits of our understanding of biology. We want to permit time for recovery. So I think that this is the single most, um, this is my sticking point because I know what kind of tissue the patient has, I know what kind of bone they have, and I, I try to advocate for rehab based on that. But we always struggle with algorithms that are very rigid in a rigid world where people want, I call them cognitive shortcuts which is, you know what, I don't need to think about this, I just need to check A on the box. So, you know, I mean, it is difficult for all of us. And one thing that, again, I heard so much today, which I'm so happy about, is you guys are all advocates to prevent further re-injury, which is so important. Um, and, uh, you know, the confounding factor, too, is that even though a lot of these tears will re-tear, some of those patients continue to do well. And so we really, we, we know somewhat what we don't know, but more importantly, we don't know what we don't know. So that's it. Do you guys have any questions? You all deserve an award because you stayed. <laughs>